Well, welcome everyone. I'm Donna Lalonde from the American Statistical Association, and I am delighted to have the opportunity to moderate this, this lecture and um, to learn with all of you. Before we get started, before I introduce Jiang Lin, um, let me encourage you to put questions in the Q&A, and uh, after the talk, we will have time for some questions. Um, well, I am so pleased to be able to introduce our speaker, Dr. Ji Hung Lin, um, who is a professor of biostatistics and coordinating director of the program in quantitative gen genomics at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And she's also a professor of statistics at the Faculty of Arts and Sciences of Harvard University. Uh, she earned her PhD at the University of Washington and spending, and after spending 10 years at the University of Michigan, she joined the Harvard faculty in 2005. Her, her research has evolved over the years, motiva motivated by the pressing analytical needs in health research. And of course, as, tonight's, as today's talk indicates, her, her most recent work has been at the forefront of COVID-19 research. Um, I'm especially interested and hope we get a chance to learn more about her um, efforts as the PI for How We Feel project that launched an app in the spring of 2020 to collect COVID-19 um, COVID health and exposure data in the US and other countries. Um, she has received many awards and honors, including being a, an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine, um, the 2002 Mortimer, Mortimer Spiegelman Award from the American Public Health Association, and the 2006 Committee of Presidents of Statistical Societies Presidents Award, the FN David Award, and most recently, the Marvin Zellin Leadership Award. Um, she's given back to the statistical and bi biostatistical community in immeasurable ways, including agreeing to give this talk tonight. Um, and she is certainly well known as a dedicated educator, generous mentor, and role model. So it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ji Young Lin for her talk tonight. And thank you so much, Donna, for this very generous uh, introduction. And also thanks ASA and COPS for inviting me um, to give this lecture. This is my first time attending the uh, GMM and uh, it is very special for me and to have this opportunity to share um, our work and with the uh, GMM uh, community. So I will sh first share my screen. So I'll share with you some of the work we have done on COVID-19 statistical modeling and analysis and, um, and also applications. Um, so uh, here is a rough outline of the talk. So I will first introduce the analysis of the Wuhan COVID-19 data. And then I will uh, introduce the analysis of US COVID-19 2020 data. And uh, through the talk, I'll provide some reflection and lessons I have learned as the statistician and through the pandemic. So let me start from the analysis of Wuhan data. And so in February um, 2020, um, um, my former postdoctoral fellow, uh, Chao Long Wang, is a professor in the School of Public Health and, uh, at Hua Zhong Science and Technology University. And um, so uh, during, uh, in uh, February uh, 2020, I wrote him a note ask how he and his family is doing because um, uh, uh, Hua Zhong Science and Technology University is located in Wuhan. And um, so he was telling me that he and his colleague were analyzing the Wuhan data. So at that time, there was already one case in Seattle and one case in Boston. So I sense that the the uh, um, disease might spread. Um, so I decided to join them and analyzing the Wuhan data. And the team worked very hard day and night and with the goal of sharing the findings with the world as soon as possible. And uh, so we finished the manuscript in a couple of weeks and then posted uh, the preprint on my archive on March 6. And so, and also I tweeted the major findings on the, on the same day. And there, it, um, it's, 
it turns out that this um, tweet and the preprint got a lot of attention. As you can see, there was a lot of download and also lots of views. Um, then this, uh, the, because the material was too much and in that preprint, and then we decided to split the work and into two papers. And one paper was um, published in um, JAMA in April 2020. And uh, this paper provides um, epidemiological analysis of the COVID-19 um, outbreak in Wuhan. And another paper was later published in Nature. And in the summer, this provide a full um, transmission dynamic analysis of the Wuhan data. So this work was co-led by An Pan and Chao Long Wang. And, uh, they, and then uh, was co-authored with uh, uh, Tang Chun Wu, who is the dean of the School of Public Health at Hua Zhong Science and Technology University. And then um, um, I got a lot of uh, media invite for interview in March. And so I turned them almost all the interview down and in March, but then the situation got worse in April. I decided that will be important to talk with the media and share with them the findings of Wuhan to help the uh, public and uh, the policymaker understand what um, the findings in Wuhan and the lessons learned in Wuhan and which can help the world. So as you can see that um, the work got um, quite a bit of media coverage and also quite a bit uh, uh, media interviews. And the one thing I learned through this process was it's important to speak in simple language without the jargon and to help the public and uh, the um, uh, the, the uh, journalists understand the scientific findings. And I was invited in April on the 2020 and to testify in the UK Parliament Science and Technology Committees. And uh, then uh, this was my first um, experience and uh, talking with uh, over 10 senators, basically. And uh, then the uh, committee prepared a, a letter to um, 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 Prime Minister Johnson, and, uh, and including several, 10 recommendations, and several of my recommendations was included in the letter. So let me share with you what we found in Wuhan. And first, let me introduce this um, RT, which is a well-known concept now. And uh, so this called effective reproductive number. So if RT greater than one, that is bad, that means the disease spread. So you can see on the right of the figure, and the, the RT is four, then that means one person transmits the disease to four people. And uh, so that is bad. So we need RT less than one to uh, control the pandemic. So we uh, propose this, um, we call Shafir model and uh, analyzing the Wuhan data. And so basically this is a Poisson partial differential uh, equation transmission dynamic model. And uh, so, um, so we extended the existing shear model and uh, in multiple ways and to uh, properly account for the nature of COVID. And so if you look at the figure in the bottom, and so between the exposure and the incubation, incubation period, um, the, this is called, uh, this called uh, be, between the exposure and the symptom um, onset, this is called incubation period. So it was about five days on average. And between exposure and the pre-symptomatic onset, this is called the latent period. So that means, uh, subject is infected, but not transmissible. And then between the pre-symptomatic and symptom onset, this is about two days. And so even though a patient doesn't have a symptom, and uh, then this person is infectious. And so in the, when we analyze the Wuhan data, we build in this um, pre-symptomatic uh, 
uh, compartment. And also in the Wuhan data, because at that time, not many testing kits were available. And so therefore we're building another component that includes uncertain cases. Those are the confirmed cases and the ununcertained cases, which uh, those are um, undetected cases. And in building this differential, partial differential equation, and observed data basically are those uncertain cases. All the other components are unobserved. And then by fitting this partial differential equation, Poisson transmission dynamic model, and then we can estimate the reproductive number. So here's a, to give you a little sense about where Wuhan located. It's in the middle part of um, China, and it has a population of uh, 11 million. It is a beautiful city. If you look at the figure on the picture on the left, and this is the river in the background is called the Changjiang River. It is the longest river in China. And uh, on the right, and uh, this is the East Lake, and this is in the marsh. It has a beautiful cher cherry blossom. And something happened in December of 2019. And so the first case was um, found on December 8 in uh, 2019 uh, in the Wuhan Huanan seafood market. And the market was closed on December 8. So the disease was highly transmissible. And this is the first feature of the COVID. So if you look at the figure on the left, each data point is the number of cases on each day. And so before uh, January 23rd, and there was no intervention, you can see the case went up very quickly. We estimated during this period, the RT value is about 3.5. So that means one person um, inf inf um, infected three people. So this disease is highly transmissible. And then on January 23rd, the city was locked down. And uh, then, um, so you can see in this, um, between the uh, January 23rd and February 3rd, and uh, then the RT value dropped uh, quickly and uh, a little about 1.2, and but then it's still greater than one. So then on January, on February 3rd, and uh, the city launched um, centralized isolation and quarantine by building uh, eight, uh, um, two new hospitals and 16 field hospitals and by converting the stadium and exhibition center into the field hospitals. And then the um, mild cases were admitted to the field hospital and severe cases were admitted to the regular hospital. So this was different from the US strategy. Then in the US in the spring of 2020 and a lot of field hospitals were built, but only um, severe cases were admitted to the field hospital and the mild cases were um, uh, isolated at home. And uh, so, um, so then you, this strategy worked quite well in Wuhan. You can see after that, and the number of cases um, the went down very quickly. And then um, by March 8, and the RT value dropped to 0.25, uh, 0.27. And the second feature we found was that um, the, the COVID was highly converted in the sense that about 80% of the cases were undetected in Wuhan. So if you look at the figure on the left, and the red indicates the uncertain cases, basically those were detected cases, and the yellow indicates the estimated undetected cases, and the blue uh, indicates the um, the the pre uh, 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 the the uh, pre symptomatic cases. So basically, the blue and the uh, the the yellow and the red together, this indicates the total number of cases. And uh, so we estimated that about eighty seven percent of un, uh, eighty seven percent of the cases were uncertain. So many of those cases were asymptomatic and mildly symptomatic. So in other words, the detected cases were only the tip of the iceberg. And so this similar phenomenon was observed in many other countries, including US. 
And uh, so this similar result was obtained later on using the serological study uh, samples um, from Wuhan. It asked, using the serological study, it found 82% of Wuhan cases were asymptomatic, and the prevalence was estimated about 6.5%. So our result using the um, severe partial uh, the Poisson partial differential equation models and give a similar um, prevalence estimate. So those results were only based on PCRs. So the takeaway um, number three is that the, the Wuhan um, case showed, the Wuhan study showed that multifaceted intervention help stop the epidemic in Wuhan. And those intervention strategy include the mask wearing, social distancing, lockdown, and centralized isolation quarantine. And so this model uh, was also later on called a Swiss cheese model. And so the intervention strategies are well known. And however, uh, implementation and the compliance of those multifaceted interventions in different countries are very challenging, and including in US. And uh, so the, in Wuhan, this strategy worked well, and then the um, outbreak was uh, stopped in less than two months. So the lesson learned from 2020, first is that the statistician need to be engaged early and be willing to learn on the fly. Um, and second, um, statistician then they talk about let the data speak. However, this is not enough. And the implementation science is equally important as a data science. So those intervention strategies and uh, are well known, but implement, in, implementing them and uh, in different countries has been quite challenging. And so the, the, during the pandemic, and so the containment policies are region specific. The, what the is um, one, no one size fit all. It will depends on diff, it had to be tailored towards different uh, countries, um, culture and the situation. Then we move on to analyze the US data. And so uh, then I'll present analysis of the US data and of uh, US 2020 data. And so this uh, work was uh, um, published in Journal of American Statistical Association and in December 2021 as a discussion paper. And so this work was um, co-led by my um, two postdocs, uh, Corbin Quick and Ronak Day. So what is the goal um, of this? And uh, so we, the, compared to the Wuhan data, because the Wuhan, the, the outbreak only lasted for two months, the data were cleaner. And uh, in US, the data much, much more complicated and uh, the data are much messier. And so the goal of analyzing the US data include the following. First, we want to estimate the RT, the effective reproductive numbers, and also the prevalence of the COVID-19 over time as a function of the covariates. Second, we want to quantify the effect of public health interventions such as um, mask wearing and uh, school closing and stay at home order on the RT and the uh, COVID incidence. So there are multiple challenges in analyzing the Wuhan data and analyzing the US data. And the first is that um, the, um, there is a significant under ascertainment and uh, the ascertainment rate varies over time because at the beginning and uh, there were not much testing kits available. And uh, so a lot of cases were unascertained. And uh, then later on, when more testing kits became available, and uh, then the ascertainment rate got higher. So the C uh, CDC serological study showed that the prevalence based on the serological surveys was six to 24 times higher than PCR-based estimate. So that means a lot of cases were unascertained. Um, second, the, uh, 
the data sources have a lot of discrepancy and uncertainty. And uh, so there's discrepancy across multiple PCR-based case data, and also the serological data um, based on antibody test, and they were not available on a daily basis. They were only available in a few days for each state. Those uh, serological studies were conducted um, by the CDC because they were expensive to conduct. And the third challenge is the, there is a, there are time lags between infection and the two pre-symptomatic um, and also symptom onset. And even um, after a patient um, got tested, and uh, then they, the report may not, uh, will generally were not available immediately, there was a lag of reporting as well. And so this uh, has quite a bit of variation. And those kind of time lag were unknown. So we need to take account of those features in analyzing the US data. So as I mentioned, the goal here is we want to estimate RT and the COVID incidence over time by developing a flexible RT regression model as a function of the time and the con uh, control measures and also geographical covariance. And uh, there are two issues we have to address in uh, the statistical development. First, we need to take into account time varying under ascertainment. So basically, the ascertainment rate was low at the beginning and uh, of 2020 because of lack of, of sufficient testing. And then in the later on, more tests became available and more cases were ascertained. So we use a logistic regression model and to incorporate, um, to model the ascertainment probability as a function of the uh, PCR test. Um, and also we model the uh, confirmed cases and also serological study to calibrate the baseline ascertainment. The second issue is we need to address the delays between the infection onset and reporting. And uh, so by modeling stochastic uh, lag time as a missing data. So the data we used for analysis include the following. So first we use the state level daily reported confirmed cases from uh, by combining the data from COVID tracking and the CDC. Second, we uh, use the PCR test data. There's a number of uh, daily tests and which are used to model ascertainment probability. Third, we have uh, used the serological study data at a few time point by CDC to calibrate the baseline uh, rate. And finally, we use the state level containment policy, such as mask wearing mandate, stay at home orders, and uh, to um, model the containment policy effect. So to address the first issue, how the under ascertainment affect the inference. So if you look at the figure on the right, then you can see the black, um, um, the, the blue uh, curve represents a number of PCR tests. And so you can see this, this is for Texas. At the beginning and in the spring of 2020, there were not many testing kits available. So therefore the small number of cases were um, tested. And then as time move on and the more testing kits become available, so more tests available. So therefore the black curve here represents the estimated ascertainment rate. So at the beginning and the few cases were ascertainment probability was low. And then later on, when more tests became available and then the ascertainment probability become higher. So the, if one ignore under ascertainment, then the instance rate will be biased downward. So we are going to underestimate the COVID incidence. And in terms of RT estimate, if the ascertainment probability is flat and uh, over time, is stable over time, then the RT estimate will be robust. 
using the classical procedure. However, if you look at the data on the right, then you can see that ascertainment probability is not a constant over time, and it changes over time. In this situation, if one uses a classical RT estimate, the estimate will be biased. So we want to take this into account. Then how can we account for the time varying ascertainment? So here, the lambda indicate the infection potential. Those basically indicate those people at risk. And uh, those are, um, then the Y indicates the new infection on each day. And uh, so those are unobserved. And uh, so we assume the Y follow a Poisson distribution with the mean RT, which is a, a, a reproductive number times the infection potential. Those are the people at risk. And uh, then RT are not observed. So what we observe is the confirmed PCR cases on each day. And so this only um, represent a portion of the new infection. So we assume that follow a binomial distribution with a binomial denominator yt and ascertainment probability pi t. And then we assume pi t as a function of testing capacity. And at the beginning, the number of tests is low, then pi t should be low. And later on, when the testing capacity become higher, and then pi t will be higher. So now we also need um, to address the second issue. That is that um, the, if one use a PCR data alone, it cannot estimate the baseline prevalence. It is not identifiable. In order to estimate the baseline prevalence, we need to incorporate additional data. And uh, so the, what those additional data? The additional data basically is a serological prevalence survey and which can help us, um, um, which were conducted at several time points. So you can see this uh, was available at a few time points. And, uh, in Texas, and then we incorporate those data and to help us and estimate the baseline um, prevalence. And so the the uh, pink curve is estimated um, prevalence, and we change over time. And now we also need to address this lag issue. So if we uh, the lag between infection to symptom onset to testing and the two reporting. So the, the, if the time lags are not taken into account, this will bias standard RT estimate. So if one use this um, na naive approach by doing a, so here, this, you can see this figure, the black indicates the true RT curve. If one just do a simple shift, and then you can see this simple shift that does not work well, doesn't capture the true RT curve. And uh, so therefore what we want to do is to use the statistical deconvolution to account for the uh, time lag. Then, um, so this basically, in order to address this um, uh, uh, time lag issue, so what we do is we need to uh, introduce a latent variable. So this uh, latent variable basically is a time lag the infection. And so this, suppose we introduce this AT. And uh, so this AT indicate the cases infected on day T, but confirmed on, on day T plus K. So the new infection on, the, on YT and are not observed. And the time lag infection are also not observed. So what we observe is the confirmed cases. So, uh, and so we, follow, we assume the lag size follow a categorical distribution. And then we perform statistical deconvolution using the EM algorithm. So I'll give you a, a, a two example to illustrate the notation. So suppose we have five days. On day one, 100 people were are infected. And because those 100 people, um, after they infected, they may not be confirmed the right way. And so you can see that among those 100 people who are infected on day one, and uh, uh, the 20 of them are confirmed on day one, and 40 of them um, 
confirmed on day two, and 40 of them confirmed on day three. On day two, and so suppose 100 people got infected again, and then so will be have 20 confirmed on day two, 40 confirmed on day three, 40 confirmed on day four, and similarly for um for the for what happened on day three. And then those A's are potentially confirmed cases. And um, then the on day one will totally will have um 20 cases confirmed. On day two will be 40 plus 20 will be 60 cases confirmed. On day three will be 40 plus 40 plus 20, that will be 100 cases confirmed and uh, potentially confirmed. And uh, But not everybody will be uh, able to get tested. And so therefore, supp if suppose we have testing 50% um, ascertainment uh, rate, then we only observe 10 cases on day one, 30 cases on day two, 50 cases on day three. And those are the observed data, the Y, A, and M, and those are missing data. And now we can see that observed data basically are the new infection and then the lab um, con uh, potentially confirmed the cases and also the observed the PCR based cases and the K is the serological data and which are observed on a few days. And so what we observe are only the confirmed cases CT and also serological um, data. Okay, those are the confirmed, uh, those are the observed data. Y and A are not observed. So that's why the EM algorithm will be useful. And now we can introduce this complete data. The complete data will involve the, if you know the A, we know the Y, so we don't need the Y anymore. So this will involve multiple components. The first component is the transmission component. The second component is the time lag component. The third component is entertainment component. The last component is zero prevalence component. And then now the, we have for the Y, and the, so the we assume it, uh, this is a, uh, um, new infection on each day, we assume it follow a Poisson distribution with a lambda, this is infection potential, and uh, then times RT, this is effective reproductive number. And uh, then the lambda is written as the weighted average of the historical new infection, and the weight is called zero interval. And uh, we assume it the zero interval, a W, um, follow a gamma distribution with the two parameter C from the literature. And now we model the RT as a function of the covariate, for example, time and also intervention measures. And we use uh, this kind of a log link. So the goal is to estimate beta and then that can help us estimate the RT and then estimate the incidence. And uh, so the lag model, so we assume the A follow a multinomial distributions to, uh, for the uh, uh, random lags. And also we build in ascertainment probability. Those basically model the confirmed cases follow a binomial distribution with the dynamical denominator. Those M is a total number of potentially confirmed case on each day, and then pi is ascertainment probability. So we assume ascertainment probability is a function of the covariate through a logistic regression, and the z is, for example, number of tests on each day. The last component is the serological survey data, and we assume the k, the serological survey data, and follow a binomial distribution with the binomial denominator big N. This is the serological survey study size and also the probability pi and p. And this basically is the total number of cases divided by the population size. And now we have the complete data, which um, will involve the A and the C and the case the observed data are the confirmed cases and serological surveyed uh, data. And A will be the potentially um, lagged um, data. And then we can write out the EM algorithm. And then this is observed data likelihood by integrating out the missing data. And then we can develop the EM algorithm for estimation. 
And so we performed the simulation study to evaluate uh, how good the performance of this we call the mermaid procedure is. So we try to simulate entertainment uh, probability mimicking the real data. So you need real data, there is a periodical effect. So basically higher um, entertainment during the weekday and the lower entertainment during the weekend. So we try to mimic the data, simulate the data mimicking the real data. So this is a, a simulated true entertainment probability. And so here are the point estimate. So the green indicate the truth. And uh, then the dash line indicate the mermaid estimate, and then the uh, the um, the pink re uh, indicate the reported count, and then the um, uh, um, blue indicated reconvolution method. So as you can see that for the RT estimate, the mermaid method worked quite well, and uh, including the beginning, and the, but the other method don't work quite well at the beginning. And also the standard error estimate calibrate really well. And for in terms of the incident as incidence estimate, so here the green indicates the true incidence because as, um, uh, under ascertainment, so many of the cases were not ascertained. So if we ignore that, you can see that the uh, incidence um, will be underestimated because mermaid account for um, under Uncertainment, so therefore the estimate are close to the truth. And also, the uh, there are several model assumptions on the, in in this um, transmission dynamic modeling, and we want to see our models are robust to those model assumptions. So we tried. Um, multiple misspecification of the model and shows that the method was quite robust when under the misspecification of several model component. Now let me move on to the analysis of the US data. And so we analyzed 2020 um, data. So C indicates the confirmed cases and T indicates the number of PCR tests on each day. And as a K, and N indicates the number of positive antibody tests and sample size at time J. And then we assume the uh, state level RT through this log linear model as function of the time using the B spline. And we want to see how the RT change over time. And for in terms of ascertainment model, we assume the probability of ascertainment as a function of the testing uh, rate. So when the testing rate got higher, and then the more cases were un uncertained. So here are the results for the state of Massachusetts. And here, the um, green curve indicate confirmed cases. So you can see that in the spring, and the, uh, most of the cases happen in the Northeast. So a lot of cases in Massachusetts in the spring. And uh, then the a uh, blue indicate the unanswered, estimated unanswered cases, and then pink is the sum of the green plus blue. And so you can see that later on in the fall, and the, the more cases and the more um, uh, uncertain because more testing became available. And so that's why the, the green become bigger, green part become bigger. So if you look at the RT estimate, you can see in the spring, the RT level was uh, quite high from 2.5. And uh, then in the summer, the RT value dropped. And in the fall, it went up. If you look at this figure, and uh, the blue curve indicates the number of tests. So at the beginning, in the spring, not many tests were available. And then later on, more tests became available. So therefore, less cases, and some probability was lower in the spring. And uh, but then became higher and uh, in the fall. And uh, so in this figure, the um, blue bars are the uh, PC uh, the serological study um, based prevalence estimate based on the CDC. And the pink is estimated curve. And from the mermaid model, you can see it go through the um, green dot well. 
So overall, we estimated about 80% of the cases in Massachusetts were uncertain, and the prevalence in 2020 in Massachusetts was about 7%. And similarly, we did analysis of Texas. You can see in the Texas, at, um, in the spring, not many cases available, but there were lots of unanswered cases. And then later on in the fall, and uh, then there were more uh, confirmed cases. And also you can see the um, case number, uh, the uh, number of tests become more in the fall and the ascertainment rate was higher. So we estimate about 42% of the cases in Texas were ascertained in 2020, and the overall prevalence was about 15%. So here's ascertainment probability um, map estimate. So overall, in the US, we estimated about 45% of the cases were ascertained in 2020. So it's basically about half of the cases were ascertained, another half were not detected. And among them, New York has highest um, and, um, and has the lowest ascertainment rate. And because in the spring, many of the cases happen in the Northeast, and the North Island has the highest ascertainment rate. Um, so on the right, that estimate uh, the state specific um, prevalence. So overall in the US, overall prevalence in 2020 was uh, estimated about 12 0.5%, and the main, the prevalence rate was the lowest, was estimated about 2%, and New York was the highest, about 20%. And then we next study the, the containment policies and uh, how the containment policy affects RT. And so in this model, we assume the RT, as we analyze all the state data together, assume that is a function of the time and also containment policy, including the mass wearing stay-at-home orders. And also we model ascertainment probability as a function of the testing rate. So here are the results. So if you look at um, the figure on the left and uh, the red color, indicates a low policy level, and uh, then the blue color indicates a high policy level. So for example, if you look at a face uh, uh, mask wearing, and in the spring, and basically uh, not many people uh, wore masks, and then in the fall, more and more people wore masks. And, and so if you look at a stay-at-home border, and so you can see a lot of people stay at home, and uh, in the spring, and then later on, the stay-at-home order was relaxed. And overall, if you look at the figure on the right, this indicates containment policy effect on the RT. So you can see the um, mask wearing significantly reduced the RT value, and also stay-at-home order significantly reduced the RT value. So this all makes sense. So there are a few limitations of the intervention effect as analysis. And first is there's possible confounding due to the time varying factors that can influ influence both the policy decision and also individual behaviors. And uh, so because the um, data um, um, covariance information were limited. And second is that um, policy data were imperfect. And for example, we don't have the, uh, the county and the city level of policy um, information. So therefore the analysis was done at the state level. And also not all policy effects were estimable the, due to nearly simultaneously deployment of the policies. And also in order to distangle um, the policy effect and the, from the time effect, and we have to assume that the RT curve, um, baseline RT curve is constant across the time when there's no intervention. The it's baseline RT curve is constant across state when there's no intervention. And uh, also we assume the policy effect is constant across time and region. And uh, so, but in reality, they may change, they may differ by different state. 
And here we only perform association analysis. And so there is uh, one need to be cautious um, when one wants to make a causal inference to evaluate uh, containment policy effect. So here's the summary of the analysis of 2020 data. So we propose the MERMIT and which address several key challenges in analyzing the US COVID-19 data in 2020. And so this framework allow us to evaluate the covariate and containment policy effect on the COVID transmission and by accounting time varying under ascertainment effect and also time lag between infection and detection, and also heterogeneity across the different sources, such as antibody studies and PCR test uh, data. Overall, we estimated about 12.5% prevalence in US in 2020, and about half of the cases were ascertained. And ascertainment uh, probability increased over time as testing became more available. Uh, and also the result showed that containment policy, public health intervention, uh, substantially reduced RT through uh, in the US. So we also develop um, in the summer of 2020, we also develop a website which provide a real time um, RT estimate at a country state and the county level. And so this website was um, featured by Nature in the summer of 2020. And uh, so this still uh, alive. And so this work was uh, co-led by my uh, former student, Andy Shi and Sheila Giller. This paper, uh, the paper was just published in Bioinformatics. So here I show you the result I just downloaded today from the website. And uh, so you can see right now the US RT value is about 0.68.86. And uh, so it's not bad right now, but in a few weeks, and uh, when the um, BA2 variants become more prevalent in US, uh, we would expect the uh, US cases will go up. And now we know that um, you can see the number of cases in China um, uh, are going up, especially in Shanghai and uh, also in Australia as well. And also here is a state uh, level um, RT value. So um, then you can see Massachusetts right now, the RT value is about 0.73, and but in a few state and the number of cases are going up. So now let's, uh, I'll talk about the challenges in analyzing the 2021 data. So there are a few challenges. First, the model must evolve with the new data. Um, when we wrote this JASA discussion paper, and this was written in 2021, and focused on 2020 data. And so what has been changed since uh, the beginning of 2021? First, multiple new variants have emerged, such as the Delta and Omicron variants, and they can, uh, may change the reinfection frequency, zero interval distribution, and also RT. Second, and the vaccine-induced antibody increase immunity in the population and also change the property of the seroprevalence uh, survey. And so for the, in 2020, seroprevalence basically measure the proportion of people who have been effect, infected. But now we cannot, we cannot use seroprevalence to estimate um, the proportion of people have been infected because many people have been vaccinated. And also in 2020, and the reinfection was not an issue, but new data suggests new reinfection is much more common than previously thought. So in about estimation RT for the 2021 data and on, and so this is influenced, RT estimation is influenced by the fraction of population who is susceptible. And so the susceptible population is infected by immunity. This acquired by vaccination and also previous infection and also behaviors in, of the uh, individual in the population and also the property of a disease. For example, the emerging variants. 
So estimating RT alone using the non-parametric model I showed uh, at the state level. And uh, so this is robust to the assumption. So we don't need assumptions about immunity, infection, vaccination, and string-specific RT. However, assumptions are needed if we want to decompose RT to identify the factors which drive the changes. So in particular, in model, so to analyze 2021 and on data analysis is more complex. And so basically we need to model the R and pi t. This is the uh, uh, estimated proportion of population in mu at time t. And so this pi t population proportion in mu at time t, this depends on multiple factor, including vaccination and also including the uh, the, 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 the infections. And um, so those can be modeled through the RT. So if the population vaccination rate goes higher and then the log one minus pi t will go down. If the vaccine efficacy goes down, then this uh, one minus pi t will go up. And also if the reinfection risk goes up and the one minus pi t will go up. And the second, um, from the, our experience is that gold standard data collection protocol are challenging and during the pandemic. And so in particular, and the traditional gold standard random sampling strategy for epidemiological study is quite difficult during the pandemic. For example, serological surveys and have demonstrated the challenge doing random sampling that caused the potential bias in analysis. And also this, um, um, we have observed the significant challenges and from the US data. And so effort are needed to improve future data collection. So here's a summary of few challenges in analyzing 2021 and on data. First, the model and assumption must evolve with the circumstance and also new data. And so the estimation of RTs alone require relative few assumptions. However, in order to understand the factors which drive the changes in RT and the more assumptions need to be made, it's more challenging. We provided a statistical framework and for empirical analysis of policy effect on RT. However, implementation of the policy is challenging and in practice. So the US COVID-19 analysis has many limitations and caveats. So the more statistical, uh, more sophisticated statistics cannot fully compensate for deficient data. So this suggests that um, strategy need to be developed for future data collection and reporting in um, epidemic and also uh, uh, building better infrastructure, for example, better surveillance uh, structure. And the pandemic has simulated innovative study design, for example, the wastewater surveillance um, the, uh, emerged um, during the pandemic has been worked quite well. And also the pandemic has simulated new methodology and collaboration. Um, thank you. Um. Thanks so much, Ji Hung. Um, I'll invite folks, we have a few minutes, so I'll invite folks to put questions in the Q&A. And maybe while they're waiting, um, I'll just ask a couple of the questions that, that, that I had. And one is, I wonder if you could say a bit more about, um, or what you're thinking about um, in terms of the uh, data collection and infrastructure. Do you have some recommendations, some ideas on, on what we should be pursuing in, in terms of that um, uh, analysis point that you made? Yeah, definitely. That is an excellent, uh, excellent uh, question. So the, the, the right, so first of all, the public health investment, as we have seen during the pandemic is not enough. And the traditional way of collecting the data and based on the existing public health infrastructure is insufficient. So each state has the public health department is small. And so it's difficult for them and to have efficient, um, have uh, sufficient resources to do the data collection. And so basically what bottom line is we need to invest in public health infrastructure. 
Um, yeah, so that that uh, I, that that makes a lot a lot of sense, obviously. And um, I actually up oh, I see a question. So let me. Um, uh, the person said, "Do you mind going back to the slide with the partial differential equations?" I think I saw ODEs there. Sure. And I'm not sure if there was a a question or just wanted to. I can uh, go back. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not seeing any question. Maybe they just wanted to. <laughs> we're appreciating the, the fact that Diffie Q was uh, uh, yeah. giving a shout out. <laughs> Yeah, so this, so this partial differential equations, um, um, this is a statistical modeling, and it's not just deterministic. So in the sense that here are the data, if you look at here are the data, here are the data, and those are the data points. This data point are the eyes. And uh, so if we go back here, this basically is the eye. Those are the data point. So when we build those partial differential equation, we need to take in, uh, into account the randomness in the observed data. So what that means is we assume the mean of the um, uncertained cases. And we assume the eyes, they basically ascertain the cases what the confirmed cases on each day follow a Poisson distribution with a Poisson mean. And then the Poisson mean are modeled through this partial differential equation. And so when we estimate the parameter, we write down the Poisson likelihood and then maximize that Poisson likelihood. And the, but the, with the mean is constructed through those partial differential equations. Thanks. I think that must have um, addressed the the question. And I guess we only have about three minutes left. So I, I would ask a question about um, on I think on the 2020 recommendations, you said let the data speak is not enough. And I wonder if you could say a little bit more about um, what you meant there. Sure, definitely. That is a great question. So this also related to the so I come over here. And the, so the those public health intervention strategy has been shown and to be effective and, uh, in Wuhan and also in many Asian countries and, uh, in 2020. And uh, however, um, the, the data shows those are effective. Those are multifaceted intervention were effective and in 2020 and uh, to control the outbreak. And uh, so however, and uh, implementing those, um, was very challenging, as we all know, and in the US and in many of the uh, Western countries. And so, so well, this is basically what I meant by let data speak is not enough. There are evidence that those intervention, public health intervention work, but to implement them and in practice very hard because a different country has a different culture. And uh, then the compliance is a challenge. And um, so, uh, so, so therefore, implementation science is critically important. And this had to be tailored under to each individual country's own situation and own culture. 